Okay, so first we're going to continue to talk about DAGs, or directed acyclic graphs. We talked about this in the previous session, so if you haven't watched that video yet and kind of understood how DAGs work, go ahead and do that. Um, this is kind of the sequel to DAGs. Um, but before we talk about the do operator, first I want to briefly talk about this idea of structural models and how DAGs kind of fit into that. Um, so if we remember this DAG right here, this shows that education causes earnings. Um, and it has all of these different confounders and other nodes that help influence education and earnings. Um, there are mediators, there are uh, other uh, confounders here. One way of writing um, this DAG is actually as a whole bunch of nested models. Um, so if you look at this, this looks kind of scary initially, but really all it's saying is that location is based on some unknown factor. And if you see the squiggly F here, that's the mathematical symbol for function. So really, it's just some location function that we don't know fully. If you think about regression again, um, when we were talking about uh, regression in session two, we were trying to predict happiness based on the number of cookies that you ate. And so you could plug in the number of cookies into some function of happiness, and then it would spit out the amount of happiness you were supposed to have based on the cookies that you ate. Um, this is a similar thing. So what's going, we're going to take some unobserved stuff, stick it into some sort of function, and it's going to spit out our location. Um, same thing with background. There's some function that generates your background um, that's based on um, unobserved stuff, and it spits out background. Job connections is caused by education, is what we said in the graph here. Um, and so there's some function where if you feed it education, it'll spit out the number of job connections you have. Um, so these are all simple functions, but it can also be more complex. We can say education is caused by required schooling, location, and the year you're born. And so if you take all three of those, shove it into some hypothetical function, it should spit out a predicted number of years of education. Um, and then finally, earnings. Um, similarly, we have another function that just takes a whole bunch of arguments, and it spits out earnings. Um, a couple important things to note about this. These functions don't have to exist in real life. Like there's, we don't have to create a regression model that predicts job connections or that creates, or predicts education or anything like that. Um, this is just conceptually what's happening in this graph here. We're saying education is created by a whole bunch of stuff and there's some function that, that generates education. Um, the reason this is nested is because really underneath, if we say we have this earnings function, um, we're feeding it education, but that education is really based on this function. So we could actually say, instead of having education here, we could cross that out and basically just plug this thing in. Um, and then instead of uh, background here, we could cross that out and we take this function and plug it in. Um, and same thing with job connections. We cross that out and it's really just this function. So we're just feeding it a whole bunch of different nested things and it can get super complex. Um, that's less important um, for the sake of this class. In real life, you care, or in if you do this causal modeling stuff like full time, um, you will care about kind of the the structures here. Um, for the stuff we're doing, that doesn't really matter. Just it's a way of thinking about this. Um, and the reason this is important is when you build these DAGs with the DAG or the DAGify function in R. Um, using the ggdag package, it expects you to define the DAGs with these nested models here. So if you remember, we wrote out this, we said there's some function that creates earnings based on education, your background, location, job connections. Um, if you drew this DAG with R, you would use this syntax here. You'd say here's earnings is explained by or is caused by education plus year plus background plus location plus job connections. And then the next node you care about is education, which is caused by these things. And so in the code, you do that. Um, and then job connections is caused by, ed by education, which is what we have here. And so this math here um, behind like the structural uh, structure of the DAG um, translates into the code for creating the DAG. And so that's kind of one way of looking at this as well, is just a whole bunch of structural models. Um, if you're familiar with psychology, um, psychology likes to use structural equation modeling for its causal inference statistics, which essentially is this. Um, it's just a whole bunch of nested functions that kind of build a DAG. They just call it structural equation modeling, but it's roughly equivalent. Um, so 
as we talked about last time, the main reason we care about these DAGs is that it explains kind of the data generating process. It explains what creates the link between education and earnings, what causes education, what causes earnings, and what um, in this one single arrow here, what is the effect of education on earnings? And that's the thing we care about the most. Um, but when you have a complex DAG like this, you have a whole bunch of other arrows that are messing up this relationship between education and earnings. So our goal with causal inference is to get this one arrow right here, our education to earnings arrow. Um, we want that to be identified or isolated. Um, and so the official language for this is called identification or isolation. So a causal effect is identified if that arrow between treatment and outcome is properly isolated. There's no other influence or no other associations coming into it from other nodes in the DAG. Um, and we talked about this last time, um, each one of the arrows in a DAG transmits some sort of association or correlation or causation. Um, and you can use fancy logic to redirect those paths by adjusting or conditioning on specific variables so that you're left with one isolated arrow that you care about at the end. Um, so to do that, um, last time we talked about these three types of associations that you get in a DAG based on the arrows and the, the direction of the arrows going to and from different nodes. Um, so we talked about confounding here, where you might have some variable z that is causing both x and y. In that situation, this x to y relationship is no longer isolated. Um, it's being confounded, it's being distorted by this other thing. And so what we talked about last time is we can get rid of this effect by conditioning on z or adjusting for z. Or we can do something statistically to z to take the z part out of x and the z part out of y, and all we're left with is x to y. And then we have an identified causal effect. Um, in this world here, where you have x causing z, which then causes y, this is a form of mediation. z is mediating that relationship. Um, what we talked about last time is you don't necessarily want to control for z or adjust for z. Because if you do, you take out the z part of x and y and your causal effect that you're talking about, the x to y effect, that's not going to be the complete effect. You're taking out the part that the z causes. And so you don't want to do that So you, if, you're, if you care about total effect. So you're just going to focus on x to y, not even worry about z. With colliders, this is where you definitely don't want to adjust for z or control for z um, because it will distort your causal effect completely. Um, and other words for this that we talked about last time is this is selection bias or endogeneity. Um, in the economics world, they use that term. Um, and so this was the example of if you're looking at um, the relationship between points scored in an NBA basketball game and height, there's no relationship. Um, short people and tall people all are really good at basketball. Um, but the reason there's no effect there is because you're conditioning on Z. You're only looking at NBA players. And so scoring lots of points and height um, both cause Z here. And so if you condition on that, if you include Z in there, it distorts your causal effects and doesn't tell you the right, um, it doesn't isolate this arrow here. So our goal in all of this is to isolate this one single arrow. Um, so we've given you some tools last week of, of how to do this. You adjust for Z, you condition on Z, um, you control for it. And in a few weeks, we'll talk more specifically about how to do that with fancy things like inverse probability weighting and matching and other things like that. Um, but one way to, um, to isolate that arrow completely is um, if we could intervene in this DAG and we could cut some of the arrows away, um, so that we're only left with X causing Y, that would be ideal. Um, then we don't have to worry about closing back doors or anything. We just see X to Y. Um, and that would be perfect. The only way to do that, though, is if you had total control over who got X, um, who got the intervention or who got the program, which is, is difficult. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a couple weeks. That's kind of what a randomized controlled trial is trying to get at. Um, the reason this works with DAGs and being able to cut these arrows is because of a specific mathematical operator that the creator of DAGs, Udeo Pearl, invented. Um, it's called the do operator. And mathematically, you can write it in a formula as just writing the word do. Um, and then open parentheses, you do the thing that you're doing. Um, what this means is that you make an intervention in a DAG. 
Um, you essentially get to cut different arrows in a DAG if you can do one of the nodes. Doing a node means having control over it. Um, you, as the experimenter or as the researcher, can tell somebody, one of your subjects, to do it or to not do it. Um, so that's what the do thing is doing there. Um, so mathematically, you can write it. This is typically how we write it. You um, write it with this P, which stands for the probability distribution of Y, which is our outcome, given, that's what that up and down line means, given that you do X. And here we, we can specify do X equals lowercase x. So if this is do the program equals the actual program versus do the program equals not the program. Um, there are different ways of writing it, um, but that's essentially what it's saying is make it so that the X node is set to a specific value. Um, so this is the X node, the capital X, the lowercase x means a specific value. Yes, do the program. Um, yes, do an extra year of education. Yes, do something that you care about. Um, so the probability distribution is one way of writing it. You'll also see it written as this E, um, which stands for expectation or expected value. Um, and you read it the same way. So the, ex the expected value or the causal effect of Y or of doing X on Y or of Y given that you do X is how you would read that. Um, so in, in these equations, y is the outcome, x is the treatment, and lowercase x is a specific value of the treatment. So this looks kind of weird and complex here, not very concrete, because we have lots of x's and y's. Um, you can write these things with regular words. You don't have to use just x and y. So for instance, let's say you want to know the effect of doing one year of college on earnings. This is how you'd write it. You'd say the expected value of earnings given that you do one year of education or you go if you do one year of college what happens to your earnings as a result um, and you can write any causally focused question in this syntax um, you can say what is the effect of government research and development funding and grants um, on firm growth does it make businesses grow more you can write that question like this so the expected value of firm growth given that you do government r d funding Let's say you're interested in improving air quality and you want to impose a carbon tax and you want to measure the causal effect of that. Um, you can write it like this and say the expected value of air quality given that you do carbon tax or what is the effect of doing a carbon tax on air quality. Um, with this example, we've been talking about um, with programs specifically, if you do a truancy program, what does that have an effect or what is the effect of doing that on juvenile delinquency? Um, and then finally, if you're thinking about international development, you might be interested in the effect of doing a mosquito net or launching a mosquito net program um, on the malaria infection rate. So this whole do syntax, even though it looks goofy here, this y given do x equals x, this is the plain English way of seeing it and of writing it and speaking about it. Um, and so this is this is kind of what we're trying to get at here. If this is the only thing you remember about the, the do syntax, that's great. Um, that's all we're doing. When we talk about do operators, we're just saying the effect of doing something on some sort of outcome y. Um, the reason this is important for DAGs is if you do x, you get to delete all of the arrows that go into that node. So if you have an observational DAG that looks like this, X causes Y, but then you have this confounder A that also causes X and Y. If you can do an experiment or a randomized controlled trial and you get to decide who gets to do X, this is what the DAG looks like. Um, you get to set X to a specific value. You get to delete all of the arrows coming into X. And the amazing thing about this is that relationship between X and Y is fully identified. This arrow right here, let's move me out of the way. The arrow right here is identified. There's no confounding. Um, A is not opening up any back doors between X and Y. It's not colliding. It's not mediating. It's just, it causes Y, sure. Um, but that has nothing to do with X anymore. This is totally independent of everything because we get to control that. Um, we get to do that and decide who does that. And so anytime you do X, you get to kind of, manipulate the graph and get rid of all of the arrows coming into that node, um, which is really cool. Um, which is why randomized control trials are so powerful is because you get 
total control over the DAG and you have much clearer causal um, inference. Um, it, you don't have to worry about closing back doors. There are no back doors anymore. Um, so what this looks like with a, with a bigger DAG, if we go back to here, this is the effect of doing college education on earnings. Um, this is our fancy observational DAG that we've been using throughout this, um, these couple sessions here. If we could somehow um, have control over who gets an additional year of college education, maybe through a lottery or some sort of randomized controlled trial version of, of giving education to people, uh, though that's probably unethical and, and impractical, but hypothetically, let's say we could control who gets to do college education, um, the DAG as a result would look like this. Um, where you still have education causing earnings, and you still have education causing job connections causing earnings, but all of the arrows coming into education are gone now, which means um, this causal relationship between education is earning and earnings is isolated, and it is identified. Um, and so all we have to do is if we use like a regression or just a, a, a correlation um, with data, if we had data on education and earnings, then we can figure out the causal effect with just a simple regression model. Um, we don't have to control for anything because that's all been wiped out. There's no influence of year or location or background or anything coming into this education node. It's all by itself and it's isolated and identified. Um, so that's that's kind of the cool power of the do operator um, is it simplifies DAGs significantly and lets you isolate specific arrows um, right off the bat. Um, so let's say we want to know the, the probability distribution or the effect of doing X on Y, but all we have is a data set that has a column for X, Y, and Z. Um, and we know that the DAG, like Z, um, confounds both X and Y. So we could just run a regression and say, what's the effect of X on Y? And just say, Y is explained by X, and we get a coefficient. Um, the issue with that is that is where we get into the correlation isn't causation world. I'm running a regression and just saying, what is the relationship between X and Y? And then we get a coefficient for X there. That is not going to be the causal effect because the causal effect has the do operator in it. That is saying, what is the effect of doing X on Y, not just X existing on Y? And calculating this does not give us the do version of it. We want to figure this out. This is the causal effect. This would be ideal if we could figure that out. Um, but without doing X, um, it's really hard to figure that out. And that's where we get to the correlation isn't causation. I know in the very first session I said never say this because it's just kind of an offhand um, rejection of any findings. Um, in this situation, if somebody's trying to prove um, just given observational data where they don't try to do anything to get rid of this do operator, then in that case, it's just correlations. The whole goal of working with observational data, given that you know about the do operator now, is you want to get rid of the do operator. Um, so if you can somehow rewrite this formula, uh, the probability distribution of your outcome, y, given that you do x, if we can make a do-free version of that, um, right here in this do-free, um, if we can get rid of the do, then, we don't have to worry about experiments and we can just rely on observational data. Um, the way we get rid of the do is where fancy logic comes into play and it's related somewhat to algebra. So if you remember from algebra, you have different variables. You might have a, a series of equations with an X and a Y and a Z. Um, if you can figure out what Z is equal to, um, you can plug whatever Z is back into your equation and figure out um, and get rid of the Z. And then you can figure out whatever Y is and plug that back into the equation and you're left with just one variable. And so through algebra, just kind of moving different um, components of equations around, you can get rid of variables and um, be left with just single things that you care about. Um, do calculus lets you do the same thing. There are, spe there are specific special rules that lets you rewrite these types of equations and get rid of the do part. Um, the official terminology for this is do calculus. Um, it's a set of three rules um, that really, really smart people have used calculus and algebra to prove um, that this works. Um, this is the official definition of it. 
it looks scary and complicated. It is scary and complicated. We're not talking about it in this class. It's way beyond the scope of this class. Um, but that is essentially what happens um, when you want to get rid of a do operator. You go through these different processes here. You apply different rules and see if you can get rid of the do part. Um, again, this is terrifying stuff. You don't have to worry about it because we've actually already talked about a version of this. You just didn't know that it was doing do calculus behind the scenes. There are two special cases of do calculus that are just kind of easier. Um, they're recognized immediately. You don't have to go through these scary rules here to find them. You just have to know about them. The first is backdoor adjustment, and the second is front door adjustment. 99% um, of the stuff that we're going to be doing in this class with DAGs deals with backdoor adjustment. And we've already talked about that in the last session. If you have a confounder, um, you want to adjust for that confounder because then that closes the back door that it opens on the association between X and Y. So if you have your treatment and you have your outcome, there are all these confounders, you want to block those confounders so that all you're left with is the identified arrow. Mathematically, what's happening there is by blocking the back doors, you're getting rid of the do operator. So here's an example. Don't worry if it looks scary here. Um, I'll point out different things here and then I'll hide myself so you can see what's under me here. Um, so this equation here, this is the probability distribution or the effect of doing x on y. So we want the causal effect of doing some program on some outcome. This can be written alternatively as this. This is a super complicated looking formula here. Um, but this is where the algebra kind of comes into play. This, these, two, these two equations here, the do side and this side that doesn't have a do in it, are the same thing. And so if we want to get rid of the do part, we can rewrite this as this version here. And the cool thing about this is this doesn't have a do. Everything in here, an x variable, a z variable, a y variable, all of those things are just in a data set. Um, we don't have to intervene. We don't have to do any sort of experiment. It's just kind of observational data. Um, the way you read this is you say the, it's basically the effect of x on y after adjusting for z. This fancy math here where if we want to technically read it, it's the sum of all of the uh, probability distributions of y given x and z times the probability distribution of z. That's super complicated. Don't worry about it. But what's really happening here, this y given x and z times the distribution of z, that is adjusting for z. That is doing something statistically with that back door to close it. And by closing that back door, this is equivalent to doing x in an experiment. And so if we can't do x in an experiment, this is identical according to um, these rules of do calculus here. So in this case, there's no do anymore on this side here. It's only on that side, so we can swap them. And all we're left with here is observational data, but it's telling us the causal effect of doing x as if we had done the experiment. And that's, that's the logic behind it. So when you are closing back doors and finding confounders and making adjustments for those confounders, the reason you're doing that is because it lets you get rid of the do. And it lets you switch out the do part for observational stuff. And you can talk legally about causal inference at that point because it's equivalent to doing the thing that you care about, um, which is really, really powerful. Um, another kind of built-in version of do calculus where you don't have to go through the scary process of applying the rules um, is this thing called front door adjustment, which we won't do in this class. It's just useful to know that it exists. Um, it was actually used to prove the link between smoking and cancer. Um, when um, epidemiologists were trying to prove that smoking caused cancer back in the 80s, um, the tobacco industry was very much against it, and they kept arguing that you can't prove directly that smoking causes cancer because genetics, um, some people are genetically predisposed to smoke and then genetically predisposed to cancer. And so really people get cancer who smoke, it's not because they smoked, it's because they have some sort of genetics which causes both. 
And so the argument of the tobacco industry was that genetics is a confounder. And so if you control for genetics, then it gets rid of that arrow between smoking and cancer, or it isolates the arrow between smoking and cancer, and there's no effect. Um, that, that effect would be zero, is what they say. Um, so what epidemiologists did is they did this front door adjustment instead. They said that tar, they know that tar and all of the chemicals in tar cause cancer. They also know that genetics cause cancer. Um, and they know that smoking causes tar buildup. So in this situation, the link between S and T right here, smoking and tar, there are no um, confounders here. Genetics does not cause tar buildup. It just happens because you smoke. And so genetics is no longer distorting this relationship. So you can, you can estimate the effect of smoking on tar or the effect of doing tar on smoking um, using just observational data because you don't have any confounders there. You can also estimate the effect of tar on cancer. And notice how this is also deseparated. There's no confounding anywhere. Genetics, again, does not cause tar buildup. It does cause cancer, but it's if we just look at this part of the dag here, ignore the smoking part, T, this arrow between T and C is identified. It's deseparated. And so what front door adjustment lets you do is you find this effect, the smoking to tar effect, and then do some fancy math to combine it with the tar to cancer effect. And if you add those two together, according to the rules of due calculus, that gives you the causal effect of S on C, or smoking on cancer. And so even though you can't adjust for genetics, because back in the 80s we didn't have like the entire human genome sequenced, and we still don't for every single person, so you can't really adjust for genetics, you can still get at this by doing this front door thing, saying smoking causes tar, figure out that effect, tar causes cancer, figure out that effect, combine them, and then you get the effect of smoking on cancer. And that is front door adjustment, um, which is a really cool thing. We won't really be doing that in this class, just know it exists. It's a special derivation of these rules of due calculus. Um, the most important derivation of due calculus is the back door adjustment criteria, which is close all of the back doors that, that distort the relationship between X and Y. And what that really does is it gets rid of the do part of your question. And then you can answer the question, the causal effect of X on Y, or the, the effect of doing X on Y. If you follow these rules of do calculus, close all the back doors, then you can estimate that do thing with just um, observational data. You can get rid of the do part of the formula and then you can legally talk about causal inference. Um, backdoor adjustment, again, is the easiest way to do this. Um, Daggity has this built into it. If you build a dag there, it shows you in the sidebar everything you need to adjust for. That adjustment is the, is the way you get rid of the do part of the formula. Um, there's also an R package called causal effect um, that uses the official three steps of the, the do calculus algorithm to determine if you can estimate a causal effect between X and Y. In some DAGs, it can get really complicated because you might have confounders, but if you control for the confounders, then that might actually open up colliders, which then distorts the causal effect. And so then you have to close off the colliders with other confounders later on in the DAG, and you have to figure out specific nodes to hit to close everything off, and it gets really complicated. Um, but there are um, this causal effect package. If you feed it a really complicated DAG, it will tell you all of the specific nodes you need to control for or account for, even if it doesn't look very obvious like a normal backdoor, um, in order to um, get rid of the do. Um, not all DAGs can be isolated. Um, it might be overly complex and you just can't isolate the effect between X and Y. And if that's the case, then you're stuck. You can't estimate the effect given only observational data. You have to do some sort of experiment so that you can cut out all of the arrows coming into X. Um, but if the rules of, of do calculus let you do it, and if there are ways of closing the back doors or maybe even doing a front door approach, then you can use observational data to get rid of the do part of these formulas, and then you can talk about causal inference using only observational data.